Hello all and welcome to our August CERC talk, which is the first talk of our three-part cybersecurity series. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, I'm Mimi Marcus, CERC admin. I hope you find this discussion beneficial and we encourage your active participation. Uh, some pointers on the participation tools, uh, as you'll note, uh, the, though you're muted, you can utilize the chat feature for comments as well as the Q&A model for questions. Uh, following the presentation, there'll be a five to 10 minutes dedicated for any questions or comments not addressed during the presentation. At this time, if you uh, would like to be unmuted, I can unmute you to allow you to ask your question directly. Um, for our participants joining strictly through the phone connection only, uh, please note that the slides are up on the CERC website for you to follow along with, and you can email your questions and uh, comments to me directly for inclusion in the discussion. Uh, Dr. Barry Beam, not only the CERC Chief Scientist, but CERC Talks Editor-in-Chief will be leading our discussion at the end of today's presentation. Uh, now it's my privilege to introduce you to our presenters today, uh, many of whom CERC collaborators are very familiar with. Dr. Barry Horowitz, who is not only a member of the CERC Research Council leading us in the Trusted Systems area, but a CERC Principal Investigator of the Systems Aware Cybersecurity Research Task. It's a six-year task uh, which focuses on cybersecurity for airborne surveillance systems onboard uh, UAVs or unmanned airborne vehicles. Uh, in addition to being Munster Professor of Systems and Information Engineering, Dr. Horowitz also served as Chair of the Department at the University of Virginia. Uh, from two, uh, 2006 through July 2013, he served as the UVA Site Director for the National Science Foundation sponsored Industry University Cooperative Research Center. Uh, which was called YCAT or the Wireless Internet Center for Advanced Technology. And in 2013, he led the UVA effort to create a new uh, National uh, Science Foundation Industry University uh, Cooperative Research Center, which was called BWAC or Broadband Wireless Access and Application Center. Uh, this follows a nearly 30 year career at MITRE spanning various roles, including the last five years as president and CEO and the three years prior as Executive Vice President and COO. I could continue, uh, but please do visit Dr. Horowitz's researcher page on the CERC website for more information. Um, with that, I turn the floor over to Dr. Barry Horowitz to explore how do we prepare the people who will need to manage the real-time responses to cyber attacks on physical systems. Uh, today we're going to discuss uh, the results of recent uh, research efforts related to human factors as they couple to the issue of resilient physical systems, in particular resilience to cybersecurity attacks, related attacks. Uh, this will be a presentation made by myself and a colleague here at UVA, Inky Kim, um, who uh, took a major role in actually the organization of the experiments. Uh, so to begin with, uh, the subject of resilience-based cybersecurity is relatively uh, new in the level of activity being associated with it, so I'm going to spend a minute on that topic. I used the definition provided by Idaho National Labs uh, in 2010 for resilience in general. And uh, if we look at uh, the definition, uh, I've added to it and separated what my additions are using red text. So, the resilience is the ability to maintain state awareness of the system in question, uh, and this implies a monitoring process, and to then maintain a safe level of normalcy in response to anomalies. So this implies a process of system reconfiguration to uh, work around the anomalies. And these anomalies can include threats of a malicious and unexpected nature. In our case, it will be cyber attacks. Uh, I've added an entire uh, additional feature, which is the data that we use from the monitoring can also be used for post-attack forensic support uh, so as to discover what really happened. Uh, on to the next slide. Uh, so our research effort has been called System Aware Cybersecurity, and uh, its focus is to add a layer of security uh, to the normal security a system might have. Uh, as a monitor for uh, anomalous events. And uh, these anomalous events are considered as illogical behaviors 
by the system when compared to the design and its expected behaviors. And when one discovers such an illogical uh, situation, uh, the ability to reconfigure. And uh, to address cyber attacks, uh, we've built on cybersecurity techniques, fault tolerance systems techniques, and automatic control technology uh, techniques, and brought those together to create this system aware idea. Uh, we use a sentinel, a monitor, that uh, does the uh, watching and the controls of the system if reconfiguring is required. And the concept for this part of the research has been that the Sentinel is, a, is managed to be extraordinarily secure compared to the system itself. And it's of a scale that's sufficiently low that you can employ uh, advanced security techniques in a practical manner. Uh, and the attacks that we consider are not only through networks attached to the physical system, but also insider and supply chain attacks. And so that's what the basic research is dealing with. And uh, if one considers uh, physical systems compared to information systems in general, uh, you can start off by being worried, as I was when we started six years ago, that it would be very complicated. But in reality, uh, it turns out the physical systems are more limited because uh, they're controlled by, usually controlled by people and not by the world at large. Uh, they have fewer system functions than an information system might have. They're less distributed in the design. They usually reside in some specific location. They're bounded by the laws of physics, uh, so the logic can't go beyond that without being discovered as being illogical. Uh, they contain less software, and they have less physical states than software states. So we tend to monitor things like position, velocity, uh, for moving uh, physical systems, temperature, vibration, uh, pressure, uh, those kinds of states, which are much more manageable than software states terms of capacity. So it turns out these are advantages uh, that one gets when you work on physical systems directly. But uh, successful attacks, in this case, can do physical harm, including killing people. So the quality of outcome has to be managed accordingly. And uh, should something happen, there may be a need in a very short period of time to respond. And so you have to be prepared to do that. And typically, you'll have operators run the physical system engaged, and they have to be trained and confident that they know what they're doing in this very short period of time for response. And our experience has shown that the people who own and operate these physical systems have no experience or expectation of physical system attacks, so uh, we have nothing to build on in the sense of operators know what to do and are confident about doing it. They are seeing demos now. so. Perhaps this will mature. Uh, and I, just as a thing I like to point out to everybody, it's not directly coupled to the human factors talk today, is that knowledge of electromechanical systems and cybersecurity is a rare combination. Few people have that combination, but not many. And so it's not easy to build up a workforce, and so education calling is there. Uh, so on the, this slide, what I'm doing is uh, giving you examples of the logical system control uh, that one might observe and recognize the anomaly and consider this as caused by a cyber attack. So for example, we can monitor the waypoints in the navigation system and notice that they've been changed, but no communication to change them has occurred. So it's probably an inside supply chain uh, kind of attack. Uh, in an automobile collision avoidance system, uh, the sensors either see or don't see an obstacle to be, that's near ready to be collided with, but the car takes action or doesn't take action, as it should, and one can assume that this is purposeful. Uh, in a 3D printer, uh, the uh, control of the microcontrollers that control temperature, uh, material selection, location of materials uh, automatically 
uh, we could start to see things that are inconsistent with the called for object spec and discover perhaps that purposeful hollow cavities are being left in the newly printed part so that it'll be very weak and fail. And in fire control systems, for example, we have an operator who might change the mode or launch or whatever, and he might do that through a touch screen, and we can monitor the control system to see if changes are occurring that the operator didn't call for, or the operator called for something and a different or no change uh, results. And all of these kinds of illogical things emerge from actual uh, prototype activities that we've been conducting over time. So we've been building prototypes, solutions, and in 2014, the end of 2014, we ran an experiment with a UAV in Georgia where we both attacked it while flying and reconfigured it while flying uh, so that it continued, could continue to operate. It was totally uh, automated, uh, this cybersecurity. And we were dealing with attacks to the uh, auto, autopilot and uh, cameras, et cetera, on the airplane. And we provided security to the Sentinel by first using triple diverse redundancy, meaning three different computer boards, three different operating systems, three different uh, software uh, versions of the uh, solution applications uh, running in parallel. And we did configuration hopping. Every second or two, we switched which of these configurations was in control of the physical system. And remember, physical systems change not in microseconds. You can change, make the change in microseconds, but the impact takes some time. So we could uh, take advantage of that. And we monitored both the airborne and ground-based subsystems for continuity. That is, did the operator send the message, given a message has been received? So you can check the things like that, forcing the uh, attacker to deal with multiple elements in a distributed system. Uh, okay, so if we go to the next slide. Some of the mechanisms we used were diverse redundancy, I mentioned, diverse redundancy and verifiable voting, which one do we believe? Hopping, just talked about that. We can do that if there's a cloud-based control system uh, with virtual capabilities. Uh, checking data consistency, does the sensor believe this? Did the recipient of the sensor get the same data? Parameter assurance. Many of our automated systems are controlled by uh, algorithms that have parameters that determine how they work, modes that continue to determine how they work, and someone can just change the software parameters uh, in the system so that it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And then doctrinal assurance. Uh, you might have three tiers of operators deciding on things to do. Uh, did all three take part in what they were supposed to do to get this outcome? Uh, so you could check that, indeed, the procedures are being followed to achieve outcomes from the system. So those are all the kinds of things you could do, and we've built capability to do things like that. And we've done it in a framework, uh, as shown on this slide, which is we have the system to be protected. We add diverse redundancy to it. We have a sentinel that's monitoring it, using data from the system to judge what's going on. And uh, it can be highly secured, as I mentioned. And then it derives when it thinks it sees something illogical, and it can reconfigure, send messages for the system to reconfigure itself uh, when appropriate. So that's the concept. And then the question is, what's the role of humans? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so there's a human factors activity. Um, and I should mention this was done uh, with a lot of different people over, over time. Uh, but the experiment that will be the focus of today's work was done with uh, support from the Air Force and AFIT, the uh, Air Force Institute of Technology. John Elshaw is the professor there we worked with. Uh, we had a uh, PhD student who has graduated just in January, uh, Chris Gay, who also was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, whose career was in UAVs, uh, so he knew a lot about uh, the factors of concern and automation. Uh, and uh, both myself and Inky Kim, my collaborator here today, uh, advised and supported the experimental activity. And so after we ran the flight test in Georgia, the question arose is how do people feel about automated resilience-based reconfigurations? And we got quite a, we've been getting quite a mixed answer to that. 
I would say the Air Force saying no way. The Army saying it has to be automated because people in a tank, for example, are too busy to fool around with this. And in the Navy, they'll say, well, we're going to start with uh, manual semi-automated capabilities and over time maybe uh, progress towards more and more automation. So we don't have a, anything like a fixed view of this. And uh, so we went off and we did a simulation-based exper experiment at Creech Air Force Base which is not the subject of today's presentation, but its conclusions are. Uh, so Creech is where we run UAV missions uh, in the Middle East. It's the most prolific manager of UAVs. And the environment that we simulated was, we did the Sentinel capability that we flew in Georgia. We simulated its outcomes and inputs. And uh, it was related to uh, a UAV surveilling an area that included a military storage facility with no people. And in this scenario, a ground-based vehicle depletes, wants to deplete the stored materials in the facility. Uh, and it decides to do that by preventing the UAV from seeing that the ground vehicle is at the facility, uh, so through a cyber attack. So that's the simulation we did. And we uh, presented to the operators on the actual displays that they use, uh, the, uh, what they would see. So in this display in the middle, you have the video that might be coming down from the UAV. Uh, on the edges, you have different buttons they can push in terms of we want to contact X, they just push a button and the contact is at X. Uh, information and data that's available to them, push the button, they can get it. And in the upper right, we added to it uh, the ability to uh, see outputs from the Sentinel about we think there's a cyber attack, here's the nature, and here's what we suggest in terms of reconfiguration. And then the question is, what do the operators think about reconfiguring based on this? And so we had the opportunity to work with eight pilots from the 432nd wing uh, at Creech. And they had some very interesting things to tell us. First, December 2014, they were unaware of any other activity looking at this question of the role of humans in this kind of scenario. Uh, the second thing they said uh, that their inclination was to assume that it's a physical problem. Something's broken, not that there's an attack. So they have no intuition that there would be an attack. Uh, third, uh, they believe that while a sentinel could tell them stuff, uh, it can't tell them stuff that's situation specific. It's all algorithms that were pre-built. And there may be intelligence information, commander information that influences what they might want to do. Uh, so they just raised that as an important context issue. Uh, many of them felt if there's a cyber attack, they don't care about fixing it. They're going to return to base. It's too risky to fool around. Others were more explicit. Uh, maybe the attacker has used attack number one, and we correct it, but they have attack number two in their wallet ready to pull out an attack they may want to reveal, and therefore not use, unless they have to. So maybe they should go home. Uh, how much time does the operator have to fool around? Uh, that's one thing we did not include in our Sentinel, a prediction of the time at which you must respond or else. Uh, so they highlighted that, which later you'll see raises its head again. Uh, and they, just like they can contact maintenance people now, if something goes wrong with the airplane in flight, while it's flying, uh, they would like to do the same with a cyber person, although they don't know who that would be, or what questions they'd ask. They're not sufficiently knowledgeable. And then, hey, they're going to run other missions tonight. Now, what about that UAV in the hangar? Is it susceptible to the same attack? So that all these questions, which made us feel bad about the naivety of the experiments we ran in terms of the operational considerations. Uh, so this sensitized us to the fact that we need a research program that addresses how the HMT, Human Machine Team, works together uh, to address all these operational kinds of questions. And uh, what happens if they disagree about the situation? For example, the Sentinel might have a misdetection or a false alarm that the operator in some way uh, sees the symptoms of. Uh, how do we select operators and train them? And what is the impact of their human, natural human uh, traits? Suspicion levels, risk-taking orientation, their improvising orientation? How does that all affect the HMT performance? 
And then how do we create learning if we'd like to in terms of uh, modifying the design either automatically or semi-automatically of the sentinels and uh, procedures uh, based on experience? And then how do we design the human interface in any event? So we have all these kinds of questions. And uh, so we graduated to another level of experiment that didn't deal with all of these, but de dealt with the uh, handling of discrepancies, and the development of operator selection criteria, and uh, levels of uh, capability that could be uh, addressed in that. And so I'm going to turn this now over to Inky Kim uh, to adjust, to discuss the experiments we've run at Wright Air Force Base uh, with uh, 32 military operators uh, that tried to get at the question of uh, operator selection and training, uh, suspicion as a feature of the operator, and uh, how it affects the operator's performance. So I'm going to turn it over to Inky. Thank you, Barry. Uh, hello, my name is Inky Kim. I'm an assistant professor. Um, specializing in human factors, in particular uh, analysis modeling and training of human performance in complex systems, including uh, cybersecurity and uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, so in this particular study, we're uh, interested, uh, we're motivated to investigate the human dimension of cyber attack detection and responses, uh, which um, while much research has been done to address the hardware and software security aspects for cyber physical systems. CPS. So this empirically demonstrated relationship between suspicion and the quality of decision in the face of unprecedented malicious cyber attacks have implications for operator selection and training. So I'm going to uh, explain a little bit about uh, the experiment that we have done. So in a nutshell, we apply the theory of suspicion as proposed by Bakko to the problem of operator detection and responses to cyber attacks in an operational context. So the level of suspicion was gauged by using seven Likert scale items organized along the three constituent dimensions of suspicion, so the degree of uncertainty, the degree of potential for malicious intent, and the degree of cognitive activation. Then we established the concept of human machine team, HMT, in operation context defined as the pairing of the operator of an unmanned ground vehicle, UGV, with a Sentinel, a cyber attack detection kit. So HMT performance consists of two components, score and time, pretty much the, the framework of uh, speed versus accuracy. So the score reflects the quality of decision making in a given situation, while time reflects the amount of time required to arrive at the decision. So the fundamental research questions seek to investigate, number one, the relationship between suspicion and HMT performance, number two, the effect of perceived consequence of a scenario on the level of suspicion and HMT performance. In order to investigate the research questions, scenario-based human-in-the-loop simulation experiments were conducted with 32 Air Force personnel as operators of an unmanned vehicle system in a military mission context. Our experimental setup connects the cyber side, the cyber domain, and physical domain together by using a remote control truck located in a terrain whose speed and trajectory are controlled and supervised by a military operator on a screen. A scenario for experimentation was carefully designed to include highs and lows of the key aspects of suspicion, including the operator's perception of uncertainty, perception of malicious intent, and perception of consequence. The location of the truck and mission goals characterized the degree of uncertainty, the degree of potential malicious intent when an anomalous event occurred, and the perceived consequences of the mission scenario. Overall, the experimental design randomly assigned 32 officers to eight scenarios according to the within-subject design and measured three dependent variables. Number one, first, uh, NASA TLX was established by NASA and used in many fields of human factors to quantify the amount of cognitive activation or mental workload. Number two, suspicion index is adapted from the suspicion theory into 13-item questionnaires to summarize the degree of suspicion 
after running a scenario, running each scenario. Number three, operator de decision responses and response time were also tracked to evaluate the quality of decision response into a score. We, we used a predefined decision tree provided as a guide for an operator to standardize the range of possible operator responses. Throughout uh, the eight mission scenarios, the participants were tasked to record UGV speed, unmanned ground vehicle speed every 30 seconds, monitor the mission track video, and scenario briefing readout from the UGV mission, and respond to system anomalies using the predefined decision tree. The list of tasks were closely aligned with the traditional unmanned vehicle system operator tasks. Next comes the result, outcome, a uh, brief outcome of the, the experiment. The two charts below summarize the findings related to suspicion and HMT performance. Overall, HMT performance, both in terms of decision quality and response time, were worse for more suspicious operators or an operator with increased level of suspicion. The chart on the right also highlights the unique role of Sentinel on suspicion, indicated by an arrow, up arrow by, uh, by red color, uh, in, indicate the increase of suspicion, down arrow by blue uh, indicate decreases of suspicion, and the length of arrow indicate uh, the, 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 the degree of uh, suspicions uh, change. So particular interest are the two cases when there is no cyber attack while Sentinel alerts rings. In other words, the case of a false alarm on the upper right corner, and when there is a cyber attack but no Sentinel alert follows. Uh, in other words, missing on the left, uh, missing on the left lower corner. In both cases, we can observe the level of suspicions amplified. Amplified. The Sentinel alerts uh, served as a catalyst for a wider spread information search by the operator whose results led to increases in operator suspicion and increased responses time. Uh, finally, um, which is not indicated in the chart, but increases in the perceived potential consequences of attacks inherent in a mission scenario uh, result in increases in suspicion level, which in turn reduced HMT performance. These are kind of a rough sketch of the findings from our study and the detailed outcome of our experimental research will be presented at the HFES Human Factors and Ergonomic Society conference in October in Austin, Texas uh, this year, and a journal publication will follow it, uh, Ergonomics and Design. In addition, the follow-up research activities are underway in two directions. First, the incremental effects of interface elements on suspicion is promising for investigation by using eye tracking analysis. Uh, by combining uh, eye tracking analysis with uh, the simulation and uh, in the cyber physical space uh, is likely to uh, reveal more uh, effects, incremental effects of um, each interfa interface design and that it has an implication for a uh, more effective uh, Sentinel interface design. Second, a cognitive decision model that incorporates suspicion can bridge the gap between reality and simulation-based study. One may be skeptical about uh, studying empirically experimenting a rare events because uh, rare events may create an operator's mental model that deviates from that uh, one in reality. Uh, therefore, it is expected that decision model, a uh, more mathematical decision model, can uh, reduce the gap between uh, the reality and uh, what's the one it's in, in experiment. Uh, by offsetting and comp uh, compensating for the differences that occur throughout the experimental setup. So this is the part of uh, my description of the experimental. Okay, so I'm going to pick up from here. Uh, so before I talk about follow-on, I, I want to talk about uh, the capabilities of the technical part of the HMT partnership. So while we did design a Sentinel, made them secure, and in fact, it's being productized by a company, uh, and just very recently received a patent called Cybersecurity for Physical Systems, quite a broad title. Uh, and uh, that design, we had never done the work to look at telling the operator how much time he had to respond. 
we did, had not done any work in that area, and we're going to start to look at that. Uh, and that may not be doable for all cases by any means. So, but it's critical that they have a boundary. Uh, the second thing that we haven't done is make uh, the ability for the uh, operator to adjust critical factors in the algorithms uh, of the Sentinel. It opens up a uh, topic of possible risk that just provides such capability. But, uh, for example, uh, if we got an intelligence report of some sort that tells us something about uh, the likelihood of an attack occurring, we might want to make the Sentinel's detection criteria more sensitive. Uh, similarly, if a commander has certain guidance to tell us that might want the Sentinel to be less sensitive, we'd want to do that. Uh, similarly, the choice of uh, reconfiguration might have variance depending on the situation. So we start to have to get into the question of in operation conditions as well as uh, the normal kinds of things you do in detection and response systems that are totally automatic. Uh, okay, so, I, and I went through that to simply make the point that we need follow-on research that both broadens the idea that uh, underpins this whole thing, that we can have resilience, and the uh, role of the operators as well as the technical systems, and think of them as a team, uh, and have an experimental base for doing the work. Many times in my experience, and I have a lot of experience, uh, the human factors community doesn't play a big role in how the systems are designed because their work takes a lot of time to do compared to someone doing a perhaps an algorithmic design and implementation or having done IR&D on an algorithm design and tailoring it to implementation. Uh, so our desire for speed to implement becomes a topic. So it's very important to get going early on this uh, before we get to the point where we don't have time to deal with these operator questions. Uh, and finally, I, and reflecting back on resilience for physical systems, put aside the cyber attack resilience. Uh, well, all systems are starting to bring together cyber and other mechanisms that constitute the basis for the system. And we have people right now who are playing the role of operator in resilient systems we have to ask ourselves, how do we go back and see what we can do with them and what the legacy there creates in terms of outcomes. So there's quite a bit uh, of work to be done. And the reason we're making this presentation is to hopefully inspire people to want to do part of that work. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Inky will be here as well to answer the questions. And I open the floor for questions. Oh, sorry, Barry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And actually, uh, I think Barry Bain is actually able to uh, speak directly. Now, Barry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. Okay. So, yeah, Barry, I'm, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, talk. Uh, I, I was initially impressed with the, the the results that you got in terms of uh, uh, creating a system that, that uh, was uh, much more cyber secure, I, I think one of the key uh, uh, contributions that you made was really uh, treating it as, as not just a, a defensive ac exercise, but really a two-person game where part of the uh, advantage is uh, making it difficult for your adversaries to figure out what you're doing. Uh, and uh but I think yeah, going beyond there, I, I hadn't really uh, uh appreciated yeah what would happen if if you uh tried this with a bunch of people who weren't familiar with uh, with this kind of uh of uh, uh of, of approach and then would be suspicious of it or would not know exactly what to how how to uh, uh treat it. So uh uh I had one question, which is, uh, yeah, if you had it to do over again, would would there be an advantage in uh, 
before you build the system, building a simulation of it and trying it with some operators and, and, and seeing what, uh, uh, what uh, additional questions came up. Yeah, so we got to that point in 2014, 2014, where we started all of this in 2011. Yeah. So it took quite a while to get to that point. Earlier, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, it's a close call as to whether because to run legitimate experiments without students being the, uh, the sources of uh, learning uh, from which we learn, uh, you have to have something credible to start with. So I don't know, you know, in, in the world whether we would have gotten to a point of the Creech Air Force Base people even when it's in the door. Yeah, the right. Air Force. So it's some mixture, but the earlier it would have been the better. So other questions from the uh, uh, participants, attendees? Uh, from Samir Kamil, uh, we have, can you recommend some publications to read on the latest uh, on discussed topics? Is there any okay, so recommended? We have, we have a good number of publications on the uh, cybersecurity resilience uh, ideas of system aware security. And I'll send to uh, Miriam the, that list and she'll make it available. Uh, Inky, this is the first publication that we're doing in the uh, human side uh, will occur this October at the Human Factors Conference that Inky referred to. And hopefully not long after we can get a, a journal publication uh, that we're finalizing now. Uh, that will make it uh, another level of detail uh, for the readers. Oh, that sounds good. Kevin, do you have a, a question? Kevin Sullivan? Thank you, Barry uh, Bayman. Thank you, Barry Horowitz. Um, and Inky, thank you very much. It's really interesting work. Um, so uh, um, in some sense, the, the combination of the tech technology components and the human components of this system constitute the overall uh, you know, adaptive and, and resilient system. Do you envision a kind of a whole life cycle systems engineering approach to the construction of such human cyber systems? And uh, what might that look like from requirements through uh, 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 formal analysis, test and evaluation, uh, and all of that? Yeah, so uh, I, uh, I am now teaching a class to the DIA community on, on resilience for cybersecurity, and I begin by talking about the history we have in doing resilient systems, which uh, in areas like our nuclear command and control weapon, command and control system, our aviation system, our nuclear power system, where there could be extreme consequences for systems running into an anomaly. And while they weren't thinking of cyber attack as the source, they were thinking about what kind of anomalies could occur. So we have a rich history uh, in those communities of addressing, uh, dealing with uh, un unanticipated but yet unanticipated events that uh, they might have to respond to and how they might reconfigure in real time to avoid the consequences and continue to operate resilient. Uh, so there are lots of uh, lessons learned there. I think that uh, critical to that is first uh, which kinds of incidents would be uh, suitable to worry about given the difficulty you have to go through. Second, for example, in the nuclear weapons, we built a system with multiple, multiple radios in case they were jammed, dust from a nuclear attack, they were sabotaged, any kind of event, uh, what would, we wanted to be sure we could deter by saying we are going to operate no matter what. Well, it turns out then operators have to be prepared to operate over nine different radio systems. And the bandwidth of the systems is different, so the quantities of data have to be adjusted from what might be normal to less than normal to far less than normal. And then you have to exercise with the operators so that they can learn how to use all this. Quite a bit of an investment that went into doing those kinds of things. And of course, a nuclear uh, war and deterrence were considered suitable. I like to say it's, it's informal, that I did my own back of the envelope analysis many years ago, 
and judge that the nuclear weapons, less than 10% or so of the force, number of people, number of weapons, consume 50% of the defense R&D budget related to operations systems. So it's not cheap. On the other hand, some solutions turn out to be operational only. They cost nothing. Let's just do it. And one of my examples of that is we had a false alarm uh, that we were under a nuclear attack in the early 80s, and we launched our bomber force uh, with their bombs uh, to holding patterns to be told to go forward if, in fact, a nuclear weapon hit the, hit the country. Uh, so, but it's pretty dangerous when you start to take weapons and put them in the sky, and who knows what the Soviets were thinking. Uh, what was the solution that was decided upon? Uh, well, first, what caused it? A chip went crazy and posited data on the warning systems displays that a four-star general believed was an attack. Pretty incredible anomalous event, uh, and that's how we uh, responded. Well. If we ever see stuff on a display, we'll call up the census sites and say, did you send data? That was one of the solutions. Cost, zero. Just an operational procedure, some training. So there's a wide variance in what you could do, what it costs, how complicated it gets, what you'd protect against. And I think we're going to have to go through all of that to figure it out. We haven't gone through anything like that in our country or cyber. So uh, uh, one thing I can add from the human, uh, from the standpoint of human uh, factors standpoint, to the whole life cycle of uh, human machine interaction, is that um, there is a big uh, component of memory. Like people on the, on the side of people, like people build up memory as people, you know, get used to the system. I think that ties to the debate of uh, adaptable versus adaptive system, and. Uh, my interpretation of the situation is that uh, we're going to need a model, a proper model, uh, to track people's mental model over time, over over use of, you know, as people get used to the system and you know people uh, get into the system of like overusing the system or abusing the system. Uh, we need to keep uh, track of those uh, mental model, collective mental model. So that's one of the motivation to approach this in terms of you know, model-based uh, approach of the human, uh, what they have in mind, I mean, from the standpoint of human. And life cycle, clearly, as new attacks emerge that we haven't accounted for, and our imagination of what could happen changes, we'd have to ask ourselves, is it across the threshold of wanting to be resilient to it? And then the operators have to be terribly engaged. And as you know, in our nuclear weapon system, they do lots of exercises, they did lots of exercises, uh, as a way of keeping the system consistent with the mental model of what could happen. Yeah, I guess there's a, a huge uh, training investment if uh, if those operators are going to be cycled through and then replaced every few months and that sort of thing. Or we don't cycle through and replace them. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yes, there's going to have to be some change. Okay, Rick Dove, yeah, you've had some similar experiences in experimenting with uh, and uh, uh, evaluating different kinds of, of human factor situations. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, I think I'm on I think I'm on mute. I can hear I can you. Hear you. Okay. Uh back on slide twenty four I believe it was, there was a mention of uh, a relationship between the sentinel and eye tracking. And I didn't quite understand that. It it almost it made me think that uh, in your experimental work you were attempting to also monitor not just the system but the operator as well, and perhaps uh, gauge some level of potentially bad decision making due to over suspiciousness. Yeah. But, um, right. So uh, that uh, the motivation to use eye tracking uh, at individual basis was, you know, traced back to the theory of suspicion. So, according to the sus theory of suspicion, uh, the, the mechanisms of uh, people's building up the l the level of suspicion is uh, starts by uh, some uh, cues, like a perceptual trigger. So the cues actually triggers, you know, people's search behaviors. 
So at the more microscopic level, uh, our, our promise is that uh, more at the more microscopic level of analysis can reveal what components of the uh, interface design actually uh, triggers more effectively uh, the suspicion level versus like less effective. So that that's the that's the question that we have because you know when it comes to the design of uh, suspicion uh, and you know Sentinel, uh, we didn't necessarily you know touch upon in this experiment that. Our, if our uh, interface design of uh, Snapper Sentinel was effective enough or not. So we didn't answer that question yet. Yeah, and let me just add, uh, just because I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, Rick, but um, the operators in our experiment are controlling these remote vehicles, so they're seeing other data than the Sentinel. The Sentinel is off on the side, as I showed at Creech Air Force Base. It's one of multiple displays. and. Uh, so their suspicion leads them to want to look at a fuller array of what they have access to and may also ask them to make uh, uh, connections to people who they want to ask questions. So they have lots of ways to use up time and get more information uh, that relate to the normal system uh, over and above the center. And, uh, and this is where you run into the issue of using up time in a manner that could be counterproductive. And we had not really dealt with that in our designs. Okay, then I think what I understand you, you said there uh, relative to the Sentinel role in this eye tracking analysis uh, is you're looking, is your, is your, uh, the eye tracking device is attempting to help you understand uh, the kinds of information the Sentinel should provide. Exactly. Okay. And what other information he was paying attention to at the moment. Yes. That is, you know, he may be looking at down at information in his own systems, Sentinel aside, using up the time. So it's really, it gives you the opportunity to look at the array of sources he has and which ones he's spending his attention on. Thank you. I'm okay, Rick Carter? Do you have a question from NASA? Um, I had a, um, my question was around, I was looking at slide 12, and I understand the idea, and we, we've actually been thinking of stuff like around these at a high level, architectural level also, although we refer more to an executive, it's a more generalized idea of, of the Sentinel. But one of the things that happens in cyber physical system world is that the operator, whether the operator is a human or a human uh, software hybrid, whatever, um, will get swamped with a lot of information and could potentially get swamped with even more information in view of uh, an actual contest, contested environment or an attack. So going back to the life cycle issue question that was asked, when we design systems, we kind of think of the design life cycle phases are like um, points in time. So I was thinking about VNV, which is one of the biggest issues that we have with this kind of thing. Um, these systems don't seem to be able to be VNV in any way, like we think traditionally, in that, am I correct in thinking that these systems, the VNV phase is literally an ongoing part of their ex their existence. In other words, you never stop VNVing down to the point that, as as I pointed in my question, we had that you were making those points about training. Maybe what we're doing is no longer training, but actually that would be part of VNV, constant exercise of the system in order to sh to ensure that it's still operating under the whatever mental model we think it has. But yes, it's training, but it sort of isn't. Is, is that out of the? Is, is that kind of like sort of yeah. on track, not on track? I think that, uh, it's exactly on track. I use training only because that's the community that owns humans at the moment. But if you look at what the Strategic Air Command did in the nuclear weapon systems, they exercised like crazy uh, because one, there were no nuclear wars to gain experience from, but except the ones we provoked. But uh, yeah, th this is all based on their predictions of what. Soviets might do and what would deter the Soviets 
from doing it. And uh, they did lots and lots of exercises and learned. And the exercises were designed to include the presidents of the United States who play a role in that system. And while they didn't get anything like full support of the presidents in terms of being part of the, they got support to doing it, but not being part of the exercises, they got some. Uh, but the four-star generals and other people who had very high positions didn't participate in those exercises. So they were pretty considered critical. Uh, oh. and, and I think that's, you're right on. That's what has to happen. You have to believe all this. And uh, you won't have enough attacks to make you believe it every day, I hope. But um, you need a committed capability to do it. So, so as a follow-up to that, the, the, the analogs that you point out, which are incredibly good analogs with regards to resilience, the nuclear power system, et cetera, and, and the nuclear strategic air force and all that, um, but those systems are still kind of what I would think towards the analog and mechanical side of things. As we move to the cyber physical, how would you – have you thought about how we would, you would propose or, or how would we deal with the time issue in, in, in the sense that I said that in a cyber physical world, my interactions with the system, specifically as an attacker, I can drown you in information and I can make your system do all to receive inputs at a much faster rate than physics would allow in an analog mechanical system. Because the virtual world, I mean, yes, it's ruled by physics, but not exactly timing wise. Am I making that clear? So let me say that. Uh, for the systems that we've looked at, there are a bunch. I told you cars, airplanes, 3D printers, weapon systems. Uh, the control systems that run the physical part of the system uh, do, are not, if they were wildly populated with data, uh, it would be from sources that are not the ones that currently populate them. Uh, if we allow those to get to the control system, we got a problem. So. We have to do much more segregation. And then the ones that can populate, we have to do a lot to authenticate them, you know, data provenance kind of thing, uh, the kind of thing I talked about, software itself in the control system, uh, the operators who tie to the control system, all of that. That you do have a safe haven to the degree you keep it as a safe haven. Now, if you don't, then you have opened up this Pandora's box. Remember, though, for resilience, you don't have to know how they did the attack. What you Correct. have to know is there's a consequence you're trying to overcome and return to normalcy. So the forensic part is separate, separable. Uh, and while the data from the uh, resilient system can be used for forensics, it can't be the source of forensics at large because there are so many ways that the system can be attacked, as you point out, and we need reams of data and analysis. So uh, my feeling is for the kinds of attacks we've dealt with, which are attacks that can kill people, attacks that can cause uh, physical systems of high value to be destroyed, those kinds of very high priority kinds of uh, things to our operational world. But we haven't run into anything where you really do need scores and scores and scores and scores of data. And I tend to be the guard at the gate, because once we do that, we won't be able to secure the Sentinel. Okay, so that's basically the, the – you've just justified so the, the broker principle. idea. You've just justified yeah. the broker idea that I had that you it, – it's similar to the Sentinel, but it's, it's in the design, but it has to be designed in. This doesn't exist by, by – by, by, it doesn't happen. In the design, you have to have some sort of broker function that basically yeah. does that interception of it's, – it's basically the next order of magnitude improvement on input check. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. So, mm. <laughs> and, okay, and that's really, a good thing. Thank you. Best. Yeah. We're doing our best to defy that, not us. No. Yes. So, it yeah. made me feel very bad when Verizon announced they have a service to help you drive your car better and it connects through the Internet. I know. <laughs> it doesn't make you happy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So let's see, Jack Ring, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my, my second question was, 
which of the four NIST uh, levels of autonomy uh, was the system to be protected and was the sentinel? Are yeah, so, so uh, when we started out, we thought this would be autonomous. But we've been disabused of that. That is, the, the military is not quite prepared to allow machines to control and, and configure their systems. Uh, and so I don't know is the answer. Uh, we have to go through uh, experience gaining experiments and operational trials and real world uses. So I think asymptotically approach some solution. And the different services, what strikes me is the three services in the military, uh, they start out with a view about the level of autonomy that's predicated on their view of operations not on whether the human has a lot to bring to the solution or the technology must have a human to be able to bring something to the table. So there's been no evaluation of what you can do automatically and whether the human worsens it or betters it. It's all based on a preconditioning view of, I want humans involved because it's too important not to. So uh, that's not a healthy thing. We should understand whether the human helps or hurts as part of that. So I think we have a lot of work to do to answer your question. Well, I understand that. Thank you. But my question is specific. In the, in the, in the UAS that you used in the experiment, huh. was it a level one level of autonomy? It appears to me that it was. Yeah. That is, it could make very many decisions about itself. Yeah. Is that the case well, that it was? essentially basically a rather dumb UAS. Yes, yes. And the Sentinel, uh, likewise, was it able to learn about no. the UA Sentinel, and to learn about we itself? No, we predisposed ourselves to say these are the nine things that the UAV uh, could be attacked. Okay. That would be so unacceptable that we're going to describe a system for monitoring and configuring around it. Thank you. Uh, second question, if I may. What did you discover that uh, is important that you didn't know about when you started this? Well, I'd say one, this human question is quite important. Uh, the issue of time to respond, whether automatic or human, uh, is important. Uh, we hadn't really thought about that. It's obvious, it makes you feel stupid, but uh, we hadn't really thought about it. We just assume you detect, you act. Uh, but we hadn't thought about uh, who might, uh, you know, not only humans, but, you know, what might want to be considered that's outside this closed uh, view of the world. Uh, and so I think we've gotten firsthand understanding of that. And, uh, the, but the major thing that we're doing now, we have a large activity dealing with it, is how do you decide which functions to protect? Uh, and that depends on not only the consequences, but the threat, uh, the uh, solutions impact on the attacker, deterrence, and the attacker's ability to find another way to attack than the way you might have conceived, conceived of. So it's a very complicated question to decide what solutions change the symmetry from being in favor of an attacker to in favor of a defender as it relates to physical systems. And um, we are doing quite a bit of analysis and design of the data you could use to figure out what, and you got a lot of questions like, we don't know how our systems work. If you go back to a 10-year-old system, say, please give me the design. It's highly questionable as to whether you'll get an accurate version of that. Uh, let me meet the people who designed it. Even if they're around, there's maybe one of them. Uh, everyone else is a specialist that doesn't know how the system works. And if you do it at the mission level, not at the acquisition system level, uh, it's a con con consortium of what we've called systems uh, that even complicate uh, how does the system work question even more. So we're having to deal with the use of models like SysML, GraphML, uh, genetic algorithms for figuring things out in terms of prioritization. 
and have quite a complicated situation on our hands. We're working with the Software Engineering Institute here at UVA, VCU has done a lot of work at, in attack trees uh, for cyber attacks, and others to uh, get answers and collaborating with military organizations as we do it. Oh, good. Yeah, I think, Jack, that was a, uh, you brought up a, 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 another complication, which is that, yeah, some people are going to want to uh, build remotely piloted uh, or uh, drones that uh, that have learning systems inside them, and uh, and uh, all of a sudden there's more vulnerabilities in spoofing the learning systems. And uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, in terms of what you've been talking about, in terms of cyber physical learning systems and how to stabilize them and how to optimize them. Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of challenges downstream in, in this area. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I think that uh, I've used as a rule is that uh, the more we force an adversary to learn about our systems, the more difficult it is. Uh, after all, what did I say? One guy knows how a system works. Well the adversaries are going to have to have guys who know how our systems work. And uh, our adversaries don't necessarily, uh, if you ever read a military spec, you'd have to say, geez, this is not the best way you can imagine for learning how a system works. And yet all these acronyms and all these uh, issues that emerge in a spec, adversaries are going to have to learn about those to learn how our system works. So mm -hmm. I think that complexity makes life tougher for an adversary. On the other hand, it makes life tougher tougher for the guy who's defending. So all these trade-offs are going to include judgments about things like that. Yes, I think it will be important to understand the ways in which the Sentinel can be compromised. Yep. For example, we're currently looking at the metaphor of the human body's immune system, which is a wonderful uh, system in its own right. Uh, but then how it's compromised by the medical profession yeah. and how that is compromised by the uh, health care insurance <laughs> <laughs> governance. And uh, it's a wonder we're all still alive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of trial and error buried in there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we've wound up our hour. Uh, so, uh, Barry and Inky, uh, thanks for a really super uh, uh, presentation of, of results, but also presentation of, of, uh, of challenges for the future. So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to uh, seeing how this uh, evolves from here. So Mimi, anything else that, that we should cover here? Uh, yep, just showing that we have the uh, CERC annual event uh, taking place November 7th and 8th, and you can register now. Uh, shortly, we'll be releasing the technical programs for both days. But hopefully you can join us for that, as well as the upcoming CERC talks. Okay, um, and then Barry uh, Horowitz has a slot in, in the SSRR? Absolutely. Good, great. Yeah. And then we have Gary McGraw and Bill Surlis coming up in the CERC talks uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, theme area. Perfect. With that, I think it, it pretty much wraps up uh, our August search talk, so thank you all for joining us.